So we have uh, the uh, Liberty Sentinel Media CEO on with us. He's a journalist, also the author of Indoctrinating Our Children to Death. Alex Newman is with us. And Alex, if I'm not mistaken, you've spent almost a decade uh, working over in different countries in, in Europe and reporting on Europe and European policies and politics. Um, and I thought you could maybe bring us a better understanding of what happened over the weekend and what's still to come. Well, thank you for having me, Beck. It's great to be here with you. And yes, I spent um, over a decade working in Europe and longer than that, living in different European countries, Sweden, Switzerland, Spain, uh, France. And uh, the media, of course, is, is being pretty dishonest about what has happened in this election on, on several fronts. Uh, for one, they're portraying this as a win for the far right. And yet they don't actually tell you what that means. They want to conjure up images of Adolf Hitler and goose-stepping Nazis. Correct. And it could be further from the truth. The parties that uh, really did very well in this election are not even close to Nazis. In fact, if anything, they're, they're more closely aligned with, like, the Libertarian Party or conservative parties that mm. just want some controls on immigration. So right there we have a fake narrative from the fake media and, you know, another part of the deception, I would say, is that this is going to have some sort of devastating effect on the globalist agenda or the mass migration. I mean, that's simply not true either. This was an election for the European Parliament. Uh, this isn't a parliament in the sense that we think of a, a sovereign legislative body. Um, in the EU, you have the European Commission, which is basically a hybrid legislative executive branch. It's very different than our system. And the parliament serves more as a rubber stamp than as a legislative body. So several big, big deceptions. But the results do uh, speak to something very important. Europeans, I think, like Americans, are tired of the globalism. They're tired of the mass migration. They're tired of the economic suffering because of the inflation and the climate policies and the war on farmers and all the rest. And they want something different. And so from that perspective, this was a very significant election. So what did Macron do when he uh, called for new elections? I don't even understand. I don't even understand that that system. What 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 did he do? Why was that a big deal? And how uh, how you know how is that going to work out for him? Well, he had to essentially after the election results. His party was absolutely crushed. I mean, and, and I mean crushed. <laughs> the, the result was devastating for his globalist establishment political party, and uh, the party that won by a, a massive margin. That uh, used to be the National Front. Now they call it the National Rally. Um, is basically the antithesis of Macron's party. They're they're very strong French nationalists. They want to preserve French identity. They uh, they want to do deportations. They want to uh, remove criminals and and illegal aliens out of France. Uh, in in some ways, you might call them anti-Islamic. They they are opposed to what they call the Islamization of France. And um, you know they're not necessarily like a, a, a conservative Republican party, if you will. They're on the left on on quite a few issues. But they are a nationalist right. party. They want to preserve French identity. In fact, until recently, they wanted to get France out of the European Union. They have now walked that back a little bit. They're more reformist, whereas Macron wants to basically surrender all French sovereignty to the EU and open up the borders wide for anybody to come in. So the contrast is very clear. And what happens in these uh, parliamentary democracies uh, like they have across Europe is that when you have an election like that and the prime minister or the, the president in the case of France – uh, has a party that is decimated at the polls, they really have no choice but to call for a snap election and then eventually step down because they, they are obviously in a position of weakness. They have clearly lost the support of the public. And so the correct thing to do then is to call an election and let the people decide their fate. So the people that were were elected, they remain. They're just reelecting the rest of Parliament. Well, I don't. I don't, I'm sorry for sounding so naive, but I just don't care about foreign governments because to me they don't make any sense. But no, I, so I get it. Glenn. What is the? It. Yeah. So is the the French system, like many of the other European uh, parliamentary systems, um, you know, the, the whole system is different, right? In in the United States, we have kind of the the two-party system, every congressional district represents a particular group of people. So when you have uh, elections in most of these European democracies, what you have is proportional representation in parliament. And so typically you'll have governing coalitions that, that take shape, um, like the, the recent government that just took over in the Netherlands, a huge blow to the establishment. They kicked out the liberals, the global, liberals by American definitions. 
um, the, the globalists and replace them with conservative parties. So what happens then is when you have these kinds of elections, and it's the same in Canada, our neighbors to the north and in Australia, when you have these elections and it becomes very, very clear that the ruling party or the ruling coalition no longer has public support, uh, the correct and proper thing to do then is to step down and let people have new elections. So this election was, like I said, for the European Parliament, but what it showed is that the French people are no longer mm, okay. with him. So he has to do the right thing here wow. and call for new elections. Okay, so this vote that happened over the weekend, let's see if I follow you, the vote that happened this weekend has very um, f- few teeth, if you will. Um, but calling for a new election if the results turn out the way it appears they might turn out, uh, it it will have some teeth. The conservatives will have some teeth. Yeah, so if, if in this snap election, uh, Marine Le Pen's National Rally Party performs as well as they did in the European Parliament elections, uh, France will look very, very different when the new government takes over. And that's a very real possibility. Um, it, it is possible that, um, you know, the, the French voters wanted... Marine Le Pen's party in the European Parliament, but not governing France. That's possible. We'll see what happens in this election. But um, yes, this could lead to some very, very profound changes in the way France is governed. And uh, that, by extension, then, w- would lead to some profound shifts across Europe. France is obviously one of the powerhouses of the European Union, one of the major economies, one of the most significant military forces. So this could have a very, very profound effect if the election goes the way the European parliamentary election suggests it does. But you're right. When you look at the European Parliament, again, I think the name is kind of misleading because people assume that this is like, you know, for example, the U.S. Congress, that they're going to have the power to radically mm-hmm. shift the trajectory of things. Um, in the European system, that's just not the case. The Parliament, I think, is best thought of as a rubber stamp, um, almost like a, a decoration for the Europeans to be able to feel like they have some kind of influence in the way the mm-hmm. EU is governed. The EU is really governed by unaccountable, unelected bureaucrats at the European Commission. So have you heard um, there's a new summit that's happening at the United Nations annual meeting? Um, It's called the Summit of the Future, which kind of sounds a little freaky. Um, And it is uh, it's it'll cover everything from climate change, international security, science, technology, youth. Uh, It's the typical bullcrap from the United Nations, except uh, one of the things they're addressing is transforming global governance. Um, And Action 36, we commit to transforming global uh, governance. Uh, Action 41, we'll reform and strengthen the United Nations. Um, they, They go into all kinds of things like our common agenda, and they're giving the United Nations um extra uh, powers uh, that can be enacted in emergencies. And so they're getting around the sovereignty saying by, by saying, oh, this would only happen in a global emergency. But we all know emergencies are always right around the corner. Do you know much about this? I do, Glenn. Actually, I broke that story in the Epic Times uh, over a year ago. It's a very, very important. I'm glad we're talking about it. In fact, I will be there covering the summit for the New American Magazine, so we'll be providing live updates from there. But I, I think of this as kind of like an attempted constitutional convention for the U.N. Uh, they want to throw off the shackles that have kind of restrained their power grabs over the decades and usurp vast new powers. And that's not speculation. Uh, The Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who, by the way, before becoming the head of the UN, was the leader of the Socialist International, which traces its lineage directly back Mm. to Karl Marx, Italy. And uh, he has put out a series of what he calls policy briefs. One of them, as as you mentioned, deals with emergencies. And I encourage people to read this document. If if I remember correctly, it's only about 24 pages. And it is just Mm -hmm. incredible transparent. It basically says in any declared emergency, global emergency, the Secretary General will assume all these new powers. The decision-making entities will be the agencies of the United Nations. It says nation states, governments, uh, civil society, business, all of them will be taking their marching orders from this uh, Secretary General and his minions. And I mean, it gets worse. They give a list of possible emergencies, and it could be anything. It could be an economic emergency, a climate emergency, an environmental emergency. It doesn't even have to be a global emergency. It could be regional. So Mm -hmm. we're talking here about an incredible power grab where all they have to do is say emergency, the magic words, and suddenly we have basically a, a global police state. So people need to be paying attention to this. 
And this is something, we're covering this tonight uh, on my uh, uh, 9 p.m. Uh, TV show. And uh, in, in doing our homework on it, 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 is, it is something that a lot of people will go, oh, well, that's no big deal. They're, they're voting on this and doing this in September, um, you know, before uh, we have a vote here in America. Uh, and if they pass this stuff... What you said is absolutely true. Any emergency will just circumvent uh, all of our governments and put all of the power into one government uh, in the U.N. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, that's a proper description of what's going on here, Glenn. And the amazing thing is that you can actually read these documents. You don't have to read between the lines. You don't really have to read through the UNEs. It's just right there in plain sight. They're talking about global restrictions on free speech. They're talking about globally uh, seizing control of economic decisions. Uh, They're talking about incredible powers, powers that would be flatly unconstitutional, even for the U.S. government to exercise. And they're talking about now having these powers exercised at the international level by people who were not elected by any people. Uh, It's frankly terrifying. I think people really need to be paying attention. It is. Most of is not talking about it. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, everything you do. And if, if you missed our, our last podcast, when was it we did that? Uh, that was, I think, remember, I have months. no concept of time. <laughs> last too, yeah, it it was, <laughs> I know, it's like everything. There's so many things that happen every day that you're like, I don't know, was that three years ago? I, I have... I have no idea. Um, But we had a fantastic, fantastic uh, conversation. Uh, And if you missed it, go look up the podcast with me and Alex Newman. Uh, And let's see, it was called, it's a global cabal, a conspiracy theory. Um, you can you can find the podcast with me and Alex, and it is well worth your time listening to. Alex, thank you as, as always. God bless. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. God bless you.